I have a complicated relationship with the term queerbaiting, because I often find that it's being used incorrectly by ship-obsessed fans who confuse genuine kindness or friendship for romantic connection. But when it comes to the most recent run of Doctor Who, the Phasmin, Thirteen and Yasmin relationship was textbook queerbaiting. <sighs> Every time I see Thasmin referred to as queerbait, a piece of me dies. Yaz is literally a queer woman. How the f*** is that queerbaiting? Totally disagree that that was queerbaiting. To me, it was a pure victory that ended the only way things ever can in Doctor Who. It wasn't queerbait. Did you even watch it? Where? <clears throat> queerbaiting is when a piece of media hints at characters being queer, but never actually confirms it and just profits off of the attention. It isn't when a character that is confirmed queer just doesn't get the ending you imagined in your head. Hashtag Thasmin, hashtag Power of the Doctor. Order of the High Council of the Time Lords. This is an impartial inquiry into the ship known as Thasmin, which has been charged with the gravest transgression against queer representation. The purpose of this inquiry is to answer one simple question. Is Thasmin queerbait? For the defense, the court has summoned the Valyard. It is my honor to accept this task. For the prosecution, meh, the doctor can do it. You're damn right I can do it. Aren't you dressed as the wrong doctor for this reference? Oh, like your costume, so accurate. And to preside over the case, please be upstanding for the venerated Inquisitor Prime, Dark El Atri- Dark El Atriqui- Atriquis- at is Big Finish responsible for this? Her from season 23. I call upon the Valyard to open the case. Thank you, Inquisitor. Time Lords, ladies, and variations thereupon. You'll find this case is quite simple. Despite what my opponent will undoubtedly tell you, words mean things. We cannot allow the meaning of queerbait to become corrupted. Queerbait, as it's most commonly defined, refers to when a film or TV show implies a same-sex relationship, or any form of queerness really, without actually depicting it. The term first emerged from online fan communities in the early 2010s, and is now commonly used by the press and has become the subject of academic journals. Queerbait is best understood as a marketing strategy. Creators realize a strong queer following may be profitable, the so-called pink dollar. Simultaneously, these creators don't want to risk alienating the more mainstream and, let's be honest, homophobic portions of their audience. So they walk the line, appealing to queer audiences up to a point, but never actually committing to genuine queer representation. This is achieved through subtext, often called queer coding, as we've seen in examples like Sherlock, Rizzolian Isles, and, most infamously, Supernatural. Unzip me. What? Why? On the hours for you and for your date. Do you want to eat? I'm not his date. Oh, cash, not for nothing. The last person who looked at me like that, I got laid. Well, it's a good thing you're not my type. What do you mean I'm not your type? That is so rude. <laughs> You ripping my clothes off in a darkened swimming pool, people might talk. King or two queens? Two queens. More than BFFs. We're LL BFFs. Queerbait relies on ambiguity. 
It must be just queer enough that it's noticed by those who are looking for it, but subtle enough that it's invisible or dismissible by the masses. I don't see how that's helping your case. Do not interrupt, Doctor. You will have your turn when the Valyard has finished his presentation. Oh, by all means, Inquisitor. If my opponent has a complaint, I'd be delighted to address it. As you wish. Proceed. Of all the 13th Doctor's companions, Yasmin is unique in that she has been present for the entirety of 13's run. Throughout all three seasons together, fans frequently picked up on queer subtext, suggesting their relationship may have been more than companionable. Are you two seeing each other? <laughs> I don't think so. Are we? We're friends. Hmm. I want more. More of the universe. More time with you. I'd rather not have met her, because having met her and then being without her, that's worse. I'm sure I miss you. Miss you too. I know you do. I hope you said I miss you too, else that bit's weird. How is this any different from what Supernatural and the others did? That does seem a valid point. What is the relevance of your presentation? Inquisitor, I do not disagree there is a similarity. It is precisely because queerbait is ambiguous by nature that makes it difficult to identify. There's already a cottage industry of queer reinterpretation. Slash fiction, fan art, shipping wars, and so on. And I'm sure the prosecution won't deny, fans have been known to see things that simply aren't there. Need I bring up Tumblr's John Locke conspiracy? We are all aware of that, Valyard. Shall we continue? Very well, my lady. The point being, how can we tell whether something is genuine queerbait or simply popular with the gays? The tension between fans and creators within the phenomenon of queerbaiting is often played out as a contest over textual meaning. That is, of whether the queerness fans see is actually there and whether the creators intentionally put it there. It is that second point I'd like to focus on first the creator's intention. Queerbait is often characterised as a promise that will never be fulfilled. By deliberately encouraging a queer interpretation, it raises the expectation that you are viewing a queer story. But by the time you find out that was never the intention, they've already got your money. Thus, in order to prove Thasmin is queerbait, the prosecution must demonstrate its queer subtext was placed there intentionally to mislead. Inquisitor, I can hardly prove what was going on in Chris Chibnall's head when he wrote it. Interesting. Because I can. The evidence for queerbait is rarely limited to the text itself, but is often proven using paratexts. Interviews, promotional material, convention panels, social media, the texts around the text. For instance, Supernatural's accusations were mainly fueled by things the actors and producers said outside the show itself. There was a rumor going around Tumblr that you were talking to a group of fans and you told them that uh, you and Jensen and the writers are all aware of this love connection between Dean and Cassie. <laughs> The producers and the actors don't really talk about it that much. Um, I mean, it, it does come up occasionally, but I do think we all pay lip service to it. There was uh, a line in the last episode that I shot where um, Jensen's character, whatever is that, <laughs> says, uh, I love you to Cassiel. And 98% sure that that was in there part for that reason. But when the episode was released, this line had been changed. I need you. I need you. Examples like this proved the creators were not only aware of the queer discourse around their show, but also encouraging it, even though they had no intention of delivering on that expectation. Whereas the paratexts around Thasmin tell a very different story. Is this a Twitter thing? Jody, when she first heard about Thasmin, keeps being sent to me. Have I missed Summit? I didn't know what Thasmin was, 
Jody said after the first season, oh, there's speculation out there, but we hadn't really thought about it. Oh, they hadn't really thought about it. Yaz's mum outright asks them if they're a couple. They clearly knew it was a possibility. Even with your puerile sense of humour, surely you can recognise a joke, Doctor. And that's how they get away with it. Oh, it's just a joke! But it wouldn't be funny unless it's based on something real, would it? Series 4 had a running joke, with the 10th Doctor and Donna Noble being mistaken for a married couple. What would you call that? Heterobait? Gentlemen, we seem to be straying from the point. I quite agree, my lady. The point is not whether queer subtext exists, but why. Even if these early scenes recognise the possibility of Thasmin, even if they derive humour from that, there is no indication the creators intended to encourage a queer interpretation. Until... Until... the 2022 specials. These three episodes were the last ones to be helmed by showrunner Chris Chibnall, as well as the final appearances of the 13th Doctor and Yasmin. And it was during the first of these specials, Eve of the Daleks, that the queer intent clearly changed. Have you ever sold her? Sold her what? How you feel about her? Is it that obvious? Just tell her. It's not that easy. She likes you. I like her too. No, I mean, she likes you. As a direct result, all those previous scenes which fans interpreted as queer have been retroactively reframed as such by this episode. I spent four years travelling the world with you. I saw it then. You didn't half came looking at that hologram. I didn't. Even if my opponent doesn't believe the queer subtext was unintentional, this new direction supersedes that. Is this not every shipper's dream? To have their speculation explicitly confirmed within the text of the show itself? Isn't queerbait specifically the denial of precisely this? Eve of the Daleks may have confirmed Thasmin, but only in a couple of scenes. It still leaves their story unresolved, creating a huge expectation for queer content in a future episode. And according to your precious paratexts, this was the creator's intent. Thasmin was something that Chris Chibnall wanted to bring in and sort of play with it. Yaz is not sure about what these feelings she's having are. Yeah, there's more to come. Both Yaz and the Doctor have hinted that they have feelings that they are suppressing and keeping quiet about. So there are some conversations that need to be had, and you'll see those conversations developing and taking place in Legend of the Sea Devils. The Doctor and Yaz have something to talk about. And did they not deliver on that expectation? In the second special, Legend of the Sea Devils, Thirteen and Yasmin have a frank conversation about their relationship. Thirteen admits she too has feelings for Yasmin. Well, this is not something I really do, you know. I mean, I used to, have done, and if I was going to, believe me, it'd be with you. But decides not to act upon them. But if I do fix myself to somebody, I know sooner or later, it'll hurt. So they both love each other. But they don't get together, they don't kiss, they don't hold hands. They have the talk, and that is all that was promised. As a creative decision, it is perfectly in keeping with the Doctor's character to turn Yasmin down. The Doctor is often portrayed as largely asexual, Stephen Moffat notwithstanding, and the romances they've had have been fairly chaste. Kisses often have double meanings, as absorbing the time vortex, or a genetic transfer. Forgive me for this, it could take a thousand lives, it means nothing. Honestly, nothing. And the Doctor has a precedent for avoiding people they care about, rather than confront difficult emotions. You could have come back. I couldn't. Why not? And why didn't you speak to me? because I thought it would hurt too much. 
Wow, read me to filth, why don't you? No, Thirteen and Yaz don't get together. No, they don't kiss. No, it's not what many fans would have wanted. But for these characters, this ending makes sense. Except it's not. It's not. Not what? Not an ending. For one thing, this is the second special, and there's still a whole feature-length episode left to go. So far, Thasmin has been the only narrative link between the specials, so it's only natural to assume this will continue. What's more, everything about how Thasmin has been presented so far screams 13 is making a mistake here. Just look at Yaz's face the moment 13's back is turned. She's devastated. Their friendship is already spoiled. And Dan does this whole speech about not missing romantic opportunities. I took way too long to tell somebody that I liked them and then the universe ended and everything got messy. I wouldn't want that to happen to you, Sheffield. Isn't that what 13 is doing? Clinging to a comfortable present because she's scared of the future. And the scene ends with 13 skimming a rock and making a wish. I wish this would go on forever. Which is immediately followed by a trailer for the next episode. Nothing is forever. The juxtaposition tells us, as if we didn't already know, 13's wish will not come true. <laughs> This episode doesn't deliver on expectations, it raises them. It seems to set up a dramatic finale, that fate will conspire to tear these two apart. The natural ending being that, in that final moment before they are separated forever, Thirteen will choose Yaz for what meagre time they have left, knowing it will hurt, but doing it anyway. Courage is knowing something will hurt. I'm doing it anyway. So, yes, a kiss, or some other declaration of love. Oh, grow up, Doctor. It's not queer bait just because you didn't get the ending you hoped for. We didn't get any ending! In the final special, The Power of the Doctor, Thasmin isn't even mentioned. It's like they've both forgotten about it. The Doctor exaggerates, my lady. Thasmin is perfectly evident in the actor's performances. <laughs> It's all right. It's all right, yes. I don't want it to end. And naturally, the subtext is still there. She spent her life gathering friends. She can't help it. And she is loved. But it's not explicit anymore. Oh, and it's been so special. You, and Graham, and Ryan, and Dan. Oh, I have loved being with you, Yas. And I love spending time with you. <laughs> if you watched this episode without having seen the last two, you wouldn't even know Thasmin had happened. It has no lasting impact on the story or characters. You'd think, when Thirteen and Yaz are saying goodbye forever, it might come up? But no, apparently that storyline's already over and done with. If that was the ending, what are we saying here? Denying yourself love is better than heartbreak? Inquisitor, this is irrelevant. Irrelevant? Completely irrelevant. It is my duty, Valyar, to decide what evidence is relevant. This is not evidence, Inquisitor. This is editorial feedback. By all means, let my opponent send his notes to Mr. Chibnall. I'm sure there are many who'd applaud him for it. But it's not queerbait just because the plot didn't go the way he wanted. It didn't go anywhere! How is that delivering on expectations? Queerbait concerns the expectation of queerness, not the expectation of good storytelling. It's when creators claim the rewards of queer representation without putting in the work. There are many examples of queerbait with parrot texts that outright claim to be queer representation. She's bi. And yes, she cares very little about what men think of her. What a joy to play. My truthful answer to you, I always thought of Dumbledore as gay. And yet, the texts themselves retain ambiguity. 
The moment was ultimately cut from the film as it distracted from the scene's vital exposition. You and Grindelwald were as close as brothers. Oh, we were closer than brothers. And they were roommates. Oh my god, they were roommates. If the text is not explicitly queer, it might as well not be queer at all. Thasmin, on the other hand, is far from ambiguous. No matter how you twist it, Doctor, a story about two women admitting they have feelings for each other, even if they decide not to act upon them, is a queer story. Can we just live in the present of what we have? There is no heterosexual explanation for this. What, you think lesbians cease to be gay if they don't kiss? Well, according to some bathroom graffiti I read... You're allowing your disrespect to show again, Doctor. Thasmin is not intentionally misleading, and it is explicitly queer. According to the original definition of queerbait, that is all the evidence you need, Inquisitor. And what if I take issue with the original definition? Just as I predicted, the Doctor would rather twist the meanings of words to suit his own ends. But it is of the utmost importance that we do not allow the meaning of queerbait to become corrupted. What often happens to words that gain popularity online, being used, reused, and inevitably misused, can dilute their original meanings. Words like mansplain or gaslight have lost a lot of their impact this way, while the word woke has been completely co-opted. With queerbait, this is not simply a matter of pedantry. The definition matters because the word has power. The discussions on queerbaiting and the accusations of queerbaiting are not just about meaning and interpretation, but are just as much about representation and visibility. As such, this discussion is an act of activism. It is not only the act of uttering a grievance, but a way of trying to affect the product. Queerbait as an idea has given queer audiences the vocabulary to identify and rally against exploitation. If we allow people to just use the word about any representation they don't personally like, it loses its usefulness as effective activism. By taking issue with the original definition of queerbait, one also takes issue with the very fight for representation. A friendly piece of advice, Doctor. If that's your argument, it might be better to just concede the trial now. Is that your defence, Doctor? Yes, Inquisitor. Ha! <laughs> I rest my case. Do you wish to reconsider, Doctor? Doctor, are you ready to present your evidence? I am, Inquisitor. For my opening statement, I'd also like to offer my learned opponent a friendly piece of advice. As a Time Lord, you really should travel a little further into history than 2010. In order to understand what queerbait is and how it works, we must place it in its historical context. Between 1934 and 1968, Hollywood was regulated by the infamous Hayes Code, which effectively prohibited queer characters from appearing on screen, unless they were villains. Even after Hayes was repealed, it left a legacy of queer stigma. So, when filmmakers wanted to include positive queer representation in their work, they did it using queer coding. I'll never use the word. There'll be nothing overt. But it'll be perfectly clear that Masala is in love with Ben-Hur. This solidified a rich cinematic language, which has long been used to tell queer stories right under the noses of the masses. It is all a matter of taste, isn't it? Yes, Master. So, the queer coding in Supernatural or Rizzolian Isles isn't materially different to that in Xena or Ben-Hur. It all serves the same purpose. And yet, the latter two are not considered queerbait. Inquisitor, this is easily accounted for with creator intent. These older examples were working under creative limitations, whereas later examples could have done more, but chose not to. How can you be sure? 
It's not like queer stigma is a thing of the past. Queer representation often faces executive oversight, or risks cancellation just for existing. In fact, queer baiters often talk like they're doing us a favour. I'll brush my Moore's blouse, or maybe linger for a moment. As long as we're not being accused of being homophobic, which is not in any way true and completely infuriating, I'm okay with it. If the queerness is not explicit, it might as well not be there. That's what you said, Valyard. But if that were true, vast swathes of cinema history would be extinguished from queer canon. In Alexander Avila's video, Queerbaiting Celebrities and Overanalysis, he argues that queer coding should not be interpreted as a promise for queer representation further down the pike. Rather, it is queer representation, just of another kind. By that logic, all queer bait would count as queer representation. Yes. You're saying Supernatural and Sherlock each qualify as genuine queer representation? Yes! They wouldn't be queer bait if they weren't recognisably queer, and they wouldn't be recognisably queer if they weren't using the language of queer cinema. Queer readings aren't alternative readings, wishful or willful misreadings, or reading too much into things readings. They result from the recognition and articulation of the complex range of queerness that has been in popular culture texts and their audiences all along. The whole time, the, the whole time, you would. The whole time! These shows aren't queer bait because they fail to be explicitly queer. They are queer. What makes them queer bait is they pretend not to be. But surely, Doctor, you must recognize the value of visibility. If we allow every Bert and Ernie to qualify as representation, creators will have no impetus to tell explicitly queer stories. Insisting that only explicit representation counts doesn't encourage visibility. It just conditions creators to find more creative ways of queerbaiting. Disney does this so often, it's become a running joke. In 2017, the live-action Beauty and the Beast boasted Disney's first ever gay character. But aside from a few oblique references, the only gay moment is a brief dance between two men. In 2019, Avengers Endgame was marketed as featuring Marvel's first ever gay character, an unnamed man in a support group played by one of the directors who mentions dating another man. Also in 2019, Rise of Skywalker finally delivered on J.J. Abrams' promise to include the first ever gay character in Star Wars, with a blink and you'll miss it shot of two minor female characters kissing. In 2021, Cruella was promoted as featuring, yet again, Disney's first ever gay character. But aside from even fewer oblique references, the only indication of his sexuality is he's flamboyant. All of these examples are technically explicit. Well, Cruella's debatable. But they were all at least promoted as queer representation. More queer than they actually were. They still misled queer audiences, so they're still queerbait. Ah, another gross misuse of the word. Video essayist Rowan Ellis has already coined the term queer catching to describe this phenomenon, where minimal or even non-existent representation is treated by creators as being more explicit than it actually is. Where queer bait denies queer readings made by the audience, queer catching encourages them. It's a different thing entirely, Doctor. Mm, not according to Professor Eve Ng of Ohio University. Queerbaiting is the outcome of increased paratextual discourse about LGBT content at a specific moment of queer contextuality. We might be tempted to reserve the term, in the sense that I use it, for media texts that fail to have canonically queer characters, despite textual and paratextual content that suggests the possibility. However, doing so would not explain why The 100, with a canonical F slash F couple, has also been widely cited as an example of queerbaiting. The crucial element is not a lack of canonicity, but how satisfactorily queerness plays out in the canonical text relative to viewer expectations. That is, queerbaiting's reference expand because the text paratext queer contextuality matrix changes over time, although its structure remains the same. This matrix she refers to is represented in a series of diagrams, which I won't get into here. I'll link to her essay, should it interest the court. Her point is, 
Even when queer representation is technically explicit, it can still bait queer audiences by being less queer or less representative than expected. It works in exactly the same way as other kinds of queer bait, so why not use the word? Heck, even Supernatural made Destiel technically explicit by the end. Yes, by barreling head first into the bury your gaze trope. Even if the show had ended with Dean and Castiel's wedding, they still strung us along for a decade. The queer bait still happened. Ing's main example, The 100, was initially lauded for its queer representation. But after dismissively killing off one of its most popular queer characters in a very cliched way, it lost the support of its queer audience. Thus, it became queerbait by failing to uphold the same standard of representation. Explicit queerness doesn't grant immunity. So, with respect to Rowan Ellis, I don't understand why there's this reluctance to let the definition of queerbait expand. But this is heresy! Inquisitor, I demand the doctor's evidence be excised from the record. Excised? Why? It is not in the public interest to reveal it. Queerbait is a specific thing. It has a specific meaning. If we don't abide by that meaning, we invite chaos into the discourse. Young actor Kit Connor was recently the target of baseless queerbait accusations, simply because he was photographed in Paris holding hands with a female co-star. But because he was a co-lead in the popular queer series Heartstopper, because he attended Pride last year, because he often dodged questions about his sexuality, his accusers believed he had been branding himself as gay, which this photo would seem to disprove. Queerbait! It's so convenient for straight actors to queerbait and play the I don't like to label myself card. However, these accusations prompted a response from Connor. Back for a minute, I'm bi. Congrats for forcing an 18-year-old to out himself. I think some of you missed the point of the show. Bye. A young queer actor was forced to come out publicly, all because a horde of conspiratorial Twitterers felt a term about fiction could apply to a real person. Just a reminder going forward, real people cannot queerbait. Queerbaiting is what the media does. By misleading you, not people. Queerbaiting is a media term. Real people cannot queerbait. Hmm, can't they though? How dare you? Are you suggesting Connor was guilty? No, no, no. Connor clearly didn't queerbait. Those accusations were completely inappropriate. I'm just not sure that's the reason why. As you said, queerbait is a marketing strategy and actors do market themselves, is it not theoretically possible that someone could pretend to be queer just for the publicity? Tattoo was a Russian pop duo in the early 2000s, as well as the sexual awakening of young sapphics the world over. The two leads, Lena Katina and Yulia Volkova, were presented as a lesbian couple, holding hands and kissing during interviews and performances. Their breakout hit, All the Things She Said, featured queer undertones in the lyrics and caused controversy for the sexualized imagery in its music video. But in 2003, it was revealed the two girls weren't actually lesbians. It was a gimmick cooked up by the group's producer, Ivan Shapovalov, inspired by the Swedish lesbian film Show Me Love. Shapovalov's goal with this, it appears, was to market the band by sexualizing the two girls. Did I mention that when Katina and Volkova first auditioned for Shapovalov, they were both 14? But even though it wasn't Shapovalov's intention to appeal to queer audiences, that is what happened. The group gained a huge following of young lesbian and bisexual women, in no small part because they believed Katina and Volkova were queer themselves. Ambiguous sexuality, deliberately misleading, exploiting queer audiences. That all sounds like queer bait to me. I want to stress, Shapovalov is the one to blame here, but it proves it's perfectly possible for real people to queerbait. And yet, as deceptive and deeply problematic as Tattoo was, it was also 
kind of a queer moment. It was about rebellion, about choosing love in a world that reviles it. Even if it was artificial, it still carried an authentic emotional message that queer fans connected with. So even genuine queer representation can be queerbait. But this Inquisitor, you must adjourn this trial at once. Perhaps that is something I should decide, Valyard. But he's corrupting the definition. No, you're limiting the definition. Representation is complicated. Our language has to reflect that nuance. As it has picked up momentum, however, queer baiting has also developed an uncompromising language that has constrained it within a very rigid rhetoric. Identity boundaries are defined very sharply and in absolute terms, as are the distinctions of what counts as baiting and power relations between producers and audiences. As such, the full scope of the issue is not being engaged in, as neither identity, representation nor producer-audience relations are as simple as they are being made to appear. Actually, this channel has already made a video about the complexity of representation, how much representation is enough. Inquisitor, that is a shameless plug. You owe the court an apology. Sorry, sorry. Let me try an example. Good omens. By your definition, Valyard, would you consider that queerbait? Um, you're referring to the 2019 TV adaptation of the 1990 novel co-authored by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman? That's the one. Uh, very well. There has long been speculation about the friendship between the lead characters. The angel and demon have a sort of opposites attract chemistry, which is expanded on in the adaptation. In paratexts, Gaiman has described the TV series as a love story, as have the lead actors, Michael Sheen and, um, Doctor? Oh, no relation. But. When asked outright if the characters are queer, Gaiman has been evasive, arguing that they are otherworldly beings, neither male nor female. The homoromantic element is left entirely in the subtext. The straight characters get a whole comedy sex scene, but the so-called ineffable husbands don't even get a peck on the cheek. They don't declare their love. In fact, they only ever refer to each other as best friends. This adaptation in a more enlightened time presented a great opportunity to make this fan-favourite love story explicitly queer. It failed to do so. Thus, I am forced to conclude that, yes, it is queerbait. Hmm. But what about the Ace reading? Um, but Sophie Aldred isn't in Good Omens. No, not her. Good Omens is very popular in the asexual community, many of whom feel represented by what appears to be a queer love story without physical intimacy. However, you just invalidated their interpretation. I did not! I never said they had to be physically intimate. You said if the queerness isn't explicit, it might as well not be there. They could still have said they loved each other. I agree, I'm not saying it's perfect representation. But even so, it's hard to read Good Omens as anything but a queer love story. And yet, because it wasn't explicit in your eyes, you decided it doesn't count as one. As the goalposts of what counts as representation move to only include the most obvious, the boundaries between identities become more sharply defined, in service of clarity. Isn't that what happened to Kit Connor? His accusers believed he could only be either gay or straight, forgetting bisexual was a thing, and so they refused his right to ambiguity. And Connor recognised the only way to prove his innocence was to make his sexuality explicit, to forfeit his ambiguity, because that's the message that you keep repeating. But uh, I... Inquisitor, this... You tricked me, Doctor. We call it queer bait. But generally, we only use it about cisgender gay relationships, and usually male ones at that, when the word queer encompasses so much more. Yes, queerbait takes advantage of ambiguity, but so do we, sometimes to reject society's labels, sometimes to keep us safe, sometimes because ambiguity itself is what makes us queer. 
When queer baiters use ambiguity to manipulate queer audiences, we naturally respond by saying, you don't get to do that anymore, we disavow ambiguity as representation. But isn't that playing the game by their rules? In so doing, are we not accepting their premise that ambiguity isn't queer? In attempting to prevent media producers from usurping these practices from queer people for their own ends, current discourses have framed them as something that should be abandoned altogether. And this can only be a loss. So what do you suggest, Doctor? We disavow the concept of queerbait instead and cede all the progress we've made? <sighs> of course not. Queerbait, the word, definitely describes a real thing which should be challenged. But if we insist on sticking with the old definition, we limit our ability to do that. Queer representation has changed since 2010, and it's always been more complicated than what the creators intended or whether or not it's technically explicit. If we're going to continue to call out queerbait, we're gonna need a more nuanced approach. What all these examples have in common is the same internal conflict. You can't have the bait without the trap. Creators want queer audiences to engage queerly with their text, but for whatever reason, they're also reluctant to actually write a queer story. The result is media that both encourages and discourages a queer reading. Supernatural and Rizzolian Isles were queerbait, not because they reneged on a promise, but because they used queer coding to suggest a queer story and then denied that's what they'd done. Encouragement and discouragement. And while I'd say Sherlock was mainly making jokes about Watson's gay panic, another problem, it still encouraged a queer reading by repeatedly drawing attention to it, after which they aggressively discouraged it. Valkyrie, Dumbledore, and all those Disney first ever gays were queerbait, because they were each promoted as being prominent queer representation, encouragement, but then that representation turned out to be minimal or absent entirely, discouragement. Incidentally, the actual first ever Disney gay, if we're not counting queer-coded villains, was Oaken in Frozen. Sure, it's pretty blink and you'll miss it, but it's not queerbait because they never encouraged it as anything more or discouraged it as anything less. Kit Connor didn't queerbait, not because he could not, but because he only marginally branded himself as queer and never once discouraged that reading. His accusers concluded queerbait because they interpreted the Paris photo as discouragement, which says more about their biphobia than it does about Connor. And Thasmin was queerbait. It has the same internal conflict. By making Thasmin explicit, by pulling what had been subtext into the text, they couldn't have encouraged that reading any more strongly. But then, in the final episode, they discouraged that reading. They discarded that storyline and put the queerness back into the subtext. I didn't even know that was a thing you could do. It's like a more advanced version of what Disney does, what Rowan Ellis would call queer catching. Endorsing the queer reading as valid, but in such a way that lets them keep doing what they've always been doing. Only instead of using the paratexts, they've done it with the actual text text. It's like they've just said, fine, you win, they're gay. Now, can we please move on? Being represented is about more than just having your existence acknowledged. Yes, we're fighting for visibility, but aren't we also fighting for authenticity? Good Omens feels more authentic to queer communities because it tells a queer love story, even if it doesn't use the words. Whereas, even though Thasmin does use the words, it doesn't use them to tell an authentic queer story. It just references queerness a couple of times and implies the authentic representation is still to come. Only, it never actually arrives. I don't know what you'd call that, if not queerbait. Inquisitor, this is a dangerous argument. Oh, what is it now? Something else that is not in the public interest to reveal. This whole trial puts the cause at risk. Thasmin may not have been ideal representation, but do you not realise how rare it is for a creator to respond to queer interpretations of their work by incorporating them into the text of the show itself? Even if it's flawed, is that not behaviour we should encourage? Instead, you dismiss it as queerbait. 
Calling something queerbait doesn't mean we have to dismiss it. The fact Thasmin was even on the table on a major show like Doctor Who proves how far queer representation has come. It wasn't that long ago the same show was condemned for its gay agenda just for having queer side characters, and now the two leads are having an open same-sex attraction. That's worth praising. So I don't bear Chibnall or the other writers or the cast any ill will, I don't think they did it on purpose. I just think they committed too late and too little. It was there as a possibility, but it very much evolved over time. You can see it being tested in the first few episodes. Chibnall mentions Arachnids as an example of early Thasmin, but also the ex-boyfriend in Rosa as an example of how it was very much open. Chibnall describing his interactions with Alderton, read Diodati Thasmin moment. Are you doing there what I think you're doing? Yes, I am. Oh, all right, I'll give it a go. This is why I don't think proving an intent to mislead is a good way of identifying queerbait. Most of the time, queerbaiters don't seem to realise what they're doing. They think they're giving queer audiences what we want. Yes, all queerbait is exploitative in some way, but I don't think Thasmin is as exploitative as other examples. If I'm gonna get queerbaited, I will pick Thasmin over Destiel every time. However, it's also important to call a Dalek a Dalek. If we fail to recognise Thasmin as the queerbait it is, creators will just assume Thasmin's standard of representation is all they have to do to keep us quiet. And I don't know about you, Inquisitor, but I'm not satisfied with that. I accept your argument. Nor, Valyard, can you refute it. <sighs> you may have bested me this time, Doctor, but I'll be back. I'll even be in the show again someday. There's always rumours. Please. They haven't even brought Omega back yet. You're way down the list. Ah, curse you, Doctor. Curse you! <laughs> Doctor, you have to help! The Daleks have invaded, and they're burying the gays! Audiences aren't ready. A happy ending wouldn't make sense. This is a woke gay agenda. Well, here we go again. The Daleks demand engagement. You will support the channel on Patreon. You will leave a comment for the algorithm. Like, share, subscribe. Like, share, subscribe.